Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us on this show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best name movie related show on the planet Earth. Coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Which one's mine today? That one. And we are so <laughs> glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also joining us, John Schnepp. Man, you guys missed out on so much crazy stuff going on right before we started, but now I can't get uh, Gary Boosie as Natasha. For, like She was talking as Gary Boosie yes. just literally a few Boosie. minutes ago. Boosie. Boosie. I like Gary Boosie. 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 Spoiler Boosie. alert. <laughs> also joining us, Perry Nemiroff. Well, you'll be able to see all that madness soon because we got a little GoPro friend over here, and you're going to see what movie talk looks like from our perspective on Saturday behind the scenes. Look at you're that expensive tripod. <laughs> <laughs> we spare no expense here at Collider. You can use it for no your GoPro. Grow and drink coffee out of it. I want all the monies for that. <laughs> and the man with all the impressions, Christian Harloff. You got it. Hey. <laughs> okay, Bruce Buffer. That all was right, so let's smooth. get started. What's the first story up today? <laughs> okay, now that Matt Reeves has officially signed on to direct the Batman, Variety's Justin Kroll is saying that due to his contractual obligations on War of for the Planet of the Apes, filming won't begin this year, but will now likely happen in 2018. Reeves' schedule would make sense, however, now Slash Film is also reporting that there's more to the story. The script for the Batman is being rewritten from the ground up. The outlet has multiple sources saying that the studio is looking to scrap the Ben Affleck, Jeff Johns, Chris Terrio script and begin with a page one rewrite. That is sure to put the final release date in flux as the movie still hasn't secured an opening weekend. John, thoughts on the Batman getting a page one rewrite? It's no surprise. I mean, it's also no surprise that the earliest we're going to get a Batman movie now is, is probably 2019. Look, I, every, every new piece of official news that comes out just confirms everything we've all been talking about before the official news comes out. Um, you know, we, it's been said for a long time that... Warner Brothers, and I'm not even going to call it a problem at this point. At this point, I'm just going to call it, uh, maybe it's a good thing. I, I, and I mean that honestly. Maybe this is a good thing. That a while ago, Warner Brothers decided they needed to change direction. They needed to scrap whatever their plan was and change direction. And we have seen event after event after event after event happen that just affirms what everybody has been saying all along, that they are going to be completely changing direction. It, don't think for a second that, oh, wait a minute, Matt Reeves is busy till the end of 2018. Till, till 2018, oh, I guess we can't do anything. No, no, they knew that. They already knew they were pushing everything back. They knew they were scrapping the script a long time ago. And then they knew Matt Reeves was perfectly fine to be the uh, director. By the way, a great director, Matt Reeves. Not as good as Ben Affleck, but a great director nonetheless. Um, they, they already knew, it's like, oh, he's perfect because we can't, we're rewriting the script and we're not going to be ready for a Batman movie until 2019, 2020 anyway at this point. This all completely falls in line with the fact that all of a sudden there's a Nightwing project, which could be great, but you know that was not part of the original plan. It, it kind of go all along the lines of we got new directors for this and this and this and now Superman 2 or Man of Steel 2, which I can't wait and God, I hope that ends up being um, uh, Matthew Vaughn directing that because that would be so epic. But it, it everything points towards every fact that comes out points towards exactly what everybody's been saying all along and a lot of fans have been in denial about to be quite honest i mean look we knew this all the way back when when we said on this show this is long before they made the announcement when we said on this show you watch ben affleck's not going to end up directing this movie he's not going to direct this movie and a whole bunch of people were like yeah, that makes sense because it looks like, you know, DC and Warner Brothers are reorientating and kind of changing their game plan at this point. But some people complete denial. It's like, no, no, he's going to do it. It's going to be great. And then 10 days later, we find out he steps down. You know, with every report that's come out uh, that has been not confirmed by the studio is being, as we move forward, more and more proven correct by everything that is being verified by the studio. But here's the thing. That is, at this point, that is not necessarily a bad thing. Yes, myself and a lot of other people out there are completely frustrated by, at, at the time that Warner Brothers can't seem to just get their plan right the first time and then move ahead. But like I said before, what are you supposed to do if the plan isn't working? I like Man of Steel. Well, no, I more than like Man of Steel. It's a freaking masterpiece of the genre. I like Batman versus Superman, but I'm in the minority. I like Suicide Squad, but I am in the minority. 
at some point, if you're a studio, it's the right thing to do. And I think Warner Brothers is probably doing that now. They've got a new plan. They've got a plan B. And what we are seeing now with all the stuff we've seen announced recently is the effects of them moving on to plan B. And if the major, majority of the audience wasn't responding to Batman versus Superman, and if the majority of the audience wasn't responding to Suicide Squad, and if like half the audience wasn't responding to Man of Steel, which still breaks my heart, if that's the case, then what else is Warner Brothers supposed to do but move on to plan B? And at, now I just hope that they put more thought and more consideration and more planning into plan B before pulling the trigger on it and moving forward with it than apparently they did with plan A because everything about plan A seemed pretty rushed and pretty paint by numbers and just put it together as they were going and make it up as they go along. If they have a new plan and they, I think they've probably been working on this plan for six plus months because I feel like we've seen this coming for six months. And if they've got a new plan and it's more solid and they put more thought into it and they seem to be getting, look, I'm still heartbroken that I think Ben, Aff ben Affleck is one of the best directors working in Hollywood today. I'm still heartbroken that he's not going to be directing the Batman film. But Matt Reeves is freaking awesome. So if you get him involved with the Batman film, you get Matthew Vaughn in involved with Man of Steel 2, you're going to bring on new screenwriters for the next Suicide Squad, which we'll get to in a minute. If they've got a really solid plan B, this can be very, very, very good news for one, Warner Brothers, two, DC, three, the fans of DC, and four, for fans of comic book films altogether. So anyway, that's my takeaway from all this. Schnepp, what do you think? Well, you know, we've been conjecturing about Ben Affleck for many months now, ever since, you know, the, I, the, the first hit, I'm not happy with the script, I'm not sure I'm going to direct it, so... That's led, you know, everybody on planet Earth has been talking about, what. well, is he going to direct Batman or not? And, you know, now he's not. Matt Reeves is directing it. Now they're not using his script either. Which, which you know has probably been the case for the last two months. Well, it's probably been the yeah, case. Yeah, I mean, well, Chris Terrio did a rewrite, and then they yep. weren't happy with that. And I, I'm going to just say I'm not sure if it, whether or not they were happy with it, but I think the overall game plan, since a lot of things are changing in the DC universe. I think, that's it. I, I think there was nothing wrong yeah, with Affleck's nothing, script yeah. or with Terrio's script. It's just that now they've got a new plan. Yeah, I just think the new plan is probably, you might still see Deathstroke in the Batman film that Matt Reeves is going to direct, or you might not. But what I think you will see is you will see Dick Grayson. You will see him as Nightwing. You will see Batman with a brand new Robin. And you'll see them talking about whoever that middle Robin was and addressing that. And you'll probably, my guess, is if Ben Affleck is the Batman in the Batman film, you'll see him pass on the cowl to Dick Grayson. And then Dick Grayson will pass on the Nightwing cowl to whoever the new Robin is. I just think it'll be like a transformation kind of thing with the Batman in order to make not only Nightwing, but the Titans and all the future movies that move forward in DC work properly, at least in the DC cinematic universe. I don't see a lot of things boding well for Ben Affleck doing more Batman movies. And that's another reason I think they're decidingly pushing the shoot of the Batman way past the Justice League movie coming out right. so it doesn't tarnish. Like people, if you hear Ben Affleck's not playing the Batman before you see Justice League, it's gonna kind of suck a little bit. So I think this lessens the blow. Either way, I think it's a good decision. Perry, you're hearing about all of this. I mean, this feels like there's more and more stuff going on, but where is your perception of this whole situation right now? All I really want is for all of the DCEU news to stop until I see Wonder <laughs> Woman and Justice League. Because at this point, we're covering another Batman story every week, if not more often than that. And it's just everything's changing. And even though part of the sto story has me excited for what we could possibly see in the next Batman movie, part of it has me nervous. I'm just not seeing anything that they're doing regarding the big picture. And I think that's what's troubling me more so than anything is, you know, not to compare DC to Marvel, but the reason that we have the DCEU is because Marvel, you know, did it first and made superhero cinematic universes a thing. And we've just gotten used to operating with like a very structured cinematic universe that has phases and a plan. And at this point, when I try to, to picture where the layout is with all these DCEU movies, I kind of can't. And these kinds of stories make, make me worry that we're going to hit Justice League and that's when decisions, bigger decisions, are going to be made. Like, get the reaction from Justice League first and then maybe we'll decide whether this Man of Steel 2 is either a straight sequel to Man of Steel or it's going to be a soft reboot. But then again, backtracking a little and just looking at this as 
good thing. They just hired a brand new director who wasn't involved with the development of the project. It makes a lot of sense for them to start from scratch and let someone as talented as Matt Reeves be part of this from the ground up. It's going to make for a better movie. So in that sense, I think this is a this is great news. The fact that he's going to be in it from the beginning, we really could end up with one of the best DCEU movies we possibly could have. On the other hand, I'm very curious to see how things play out this year because I guarantee you at the end of 2017, we're going to be having very different conversations about this. Well, it's true. But Christian, let me ask you this. One of the things that I personally have really enjoyed about the DCEU up until this point, talking about Man of Steel, Batman vs. Superman, and Suicide Squad, is that tonally, it has been very different from the Marvel movies. And I love the Marvel movies. I love the way they are for them, but I've really liked the tone that, you know, I like the darker, the grittier tone that DC, the DCEU has had so far. Do you think in hearing about them bringing in Nightwing, a, a director like Matthew Vaughn, who has done some of my He's, favorite films. Oh, Matthew Vaughn. Yeah, the, yeah, who's done some of my favorite films, like whether it's Kick-Ass or whether it's um, you know Stardust or whether it's X-Men First Class or whether it's Kingsman, stuff like that. I'm hearing some people expressing some concern that because of the types of movies Matthew Vaughn has done, because of bringing in characters like, wh whether it's Gotham City Sirens or characters like, like Nightwing, there are some people I'm hearing that are a little bit concerned that maybe DC, in part of this plan B, is shifting their tone more towards the Marvel style of tone. Whereas somebody like me, I've liked the tone that they've had. Do you think the news we're hearing, number one, what do you think of it overall? But number two, do you think the news we're hearing signifies that maybe DC and Warner Brothers may be changing their tone more towards a Marvel-style tone? No, I don't think they're going towards Marvel. I think they, they want to create their own specific tone. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to lighten things up a little bit. We already saw that in the stuff that we saw with the Just Justice League trailers, with the Flash jokes and certain things that we didn't see in other movies, too. Um, so I think that they're... They were always, the plan was always to just lighten it up a little bit, but I don't think they're going to go towards Marvel, nor should I think, nor do I think they should try no, to go shouldn't. down that. They should stick to what they're doing, and I think that they will do that for sure. As much as I love when you go into the ultimate sweat mode with stuff, I don't think that they're going to go that plan with Nightwing and everything right away. I think that because what they're going to do with Matt Reeves, they're going to recreate Batman, let us get used to this this Batman, uh, and how long they they can lock Ben Affleck down to make sure maybe. maybe this is the thing that we need to realize, and we have to, and you know, we got to address the elephant in the room too. The things that are happening with Ben Affleck's personal life right now, we have to take in consideration that might be one of the reasons why maybe even he was like, I don't know if me directing right now is the thing that I should handle. In general, without personal problems, this is something that when you are the star of Batman, this is not just like uh, he was, I know he's the star of the town, I know he's a star of Argo. Batman, when, when all eyes are on you and in the first place, when you are announced as Batman and everyone's going, that ah, guy can't do that, and then you knock it out of the park and it's like, oh, not only were you really good in that, now we want you to direct the next one. Now we want all, the, the, the big Batman, it's all on your shoulders, plus everything else going in your life. Go, what do you got? That's tough. He's a human being. So I understand why he needs to kind of, that he needs to move on and do things, but also you have to realize when Matthew Reeves comes on board, he's going to go, I want to do this movie. I don't necessarily think I want to do this particular script. Let's do some rewrites. That's what happens when you bring in a new director. Sometimes our director come on, we, we got to shoot that. Like that, that Natalie Portman, Jane Got a Gun movie, when Gavin, uh, Gavin O'Connor came in mm -hmm. for like, you, you got to shoot this. Yeah, we got we have, next week. All right, fine. I'll shoot. I'll shoot whatever you have on the page. But when you have this much time, he's gonna he's gonna break it down. They're gonna this this is nothing to panic panic about. This is you should be if you're a DC fan, you should be excited about this news. I think this is where you should kick back and go. Okay, mm -hmm. they're not just rushing into this. They're putting together all the good pieces because this is what you do when you want it to work. When you're not doing the same old steps, you go after a Matthew Vaughn. You go after a Matthew Reeves. You take care of your star that's been good to you for a while. You say, okay, go d help yourself. G get get right. better. Come back. Kick ass. And that seems that's the way I'm reading it. That's the way that I've seen this so far. So um, and the tone wise, I'm not worried about it. I want, I'm, I'm with Perry. I'll worry about tone when I see Wonder Woman and Justice League, and, and if things still see the same and nothing's changing, then we can talk about tone. But for right now, I like what I'm hearing. At, look, at this point, I think this is this is just pure speculation at this point. So this is what I'm speculating right now, and this could change when we get new information. At this point, I don't think them changing script had anything to do with them bringing in. Uh, 
Matt Reeves at all to direct it. I think they already knew they wanted to change the direction, and then they brought in Matt Reeves because he was the guy who can help them get to where they want to go with this. I also think Warner Brothers wisely has changed their philosophy because there was a time early in this DC Cinematic Universe where they were just saying, each director, just make up your own movie. Just go, 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 go. And there was no overall picture that they had to confine themselves to, much like a Marvel does. Like mm -hmm. uh, uh, They bring in great directors, but Kevin Feige says, but here's where our overall story's going. Just make sure your movie fits within mm -hmm. this. I have a feeling that Warner Brothers has regrouped they said, okay, we're going to create an overall plan now for our cinematic universe, which is something they never had before, at least not a solid one. I think now they're saying, we're going to create an overall plan. Here's where we need each movie to go. Matt, Re or, uh, yeah, Matt Reeves, come on in. Okay, this is going to be the standalone Batman movie. This is where we're going to be after Justice League. We need Batman, and we need this and this and this point, one, two, three, four, five, six, to happen by the end of this movie. Now you go and make the movie that you want to make, just making sure that it fits within the overall scope. And then they get a, a filmmaker like Matt Reeve to come in and do that. I still think it's 50-50 at this point on whether or not um, and this is aside from the personal issues, totally yeah. aside from the personal issues. I think it's 50-50 at this point whether or not Ben Affleck will be Batman by the time the Batman movie comes around, like by the time we get out of Justice League. Because I think they made, we know they're doing some extensive reshooting on Justice League right now. We know that part of their original plan was not to have Green Lantern in it, but if you take Henry Cavill's tweets to mean anything, it sounds like now they're going to put in a Green Lantern, which signifies some overall changes. Uh, but I still think it's 50-50 uh, that Ben Affleck shows up as Batman in the Batman movie. I think it's like a 99% chance that he's not Batman anymore after Batman movie. And I think that'll be his choice uh, to do that. Regardless of whatever you think his motivations are, I think that'll be his choice. But it's an interesting time. Sure. But, but I think it's an encouraging time. Because at some point, when things aren't going right... If you're a smart company, and Warner Brothers is an incredibly smart company, you gotta get, you got to say, it's time to cut bait on the plan that we had. It didn't work the, the way we wanted it to work. Let's formulate a new, better plan, put more thought into it, more planning, get the right people in place, get a better overall strategy, and start moving forward. And I think if you're a DC fan, this type of stuff should be things that make you feel pretty damn good. That's just my thought. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Let us know what you think. Jump into the comments section. Are you encouraged by all the stuff that we're starting to see coming to WB with the DC Cinematic Universe? Are you more concerned? What do you guys think? Leave your thoughts below. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Okay, THR is reporting that Warner Brothers is in negotiations to hire a new writer for Suicide Squad and have settled on Jack Ryan, Shadow Recruit, and the Legend of Tarzan screenwriter Adam Kozad for the task. David Ayer will not be returning for the movie and will instead lead Gotham City Sirens, a movie that reteams re him with Suicide Squad star Margot Robbie. There is currently no release date set for the movie, but a short list of directors has been revealed that include Mel Gibson, 5050's Jonathan Levine, Life's Daniel Espinosa, and Zombieland's Ruben Fleischer. Schnapp thoughts on Adam Kozad writing Suicide Squad 2. Sure. I mean, why not? <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> Christian. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of with Schnepp on this. It's like, it, I understand. I didn't, I think that I actually liked Suicide Squad less than you did. Right. I think you enjoyed it. I did. Um, but I think that we're both in agreement that I, I'm, I would like to see what comes next. I yeah. would like to see what someone else does with it. And I'd also like to see, going back to what I was just talking about, I'd like to see if DC says, okay, I want to take some of the criticisms. Well, let's, we're going to take some of the criticisms that we got that we agree with, and we're going to try, try to shift this thing into part two. And if this guy's the guy that's going to do that, then great, I'm all for it. Yeah, look, I, I, I'm the first one to admit, Suicide Squad was a bloody mess. It was a mess. But I had so much fun with that movie mm -hmm. that I put on the Harley Quinn outfit and everything. <laughs> in my room. I thought it was a fun movie. I thought yeah. it was fun, and I enjoyed it. But I think this, once again, goes to what we are talking about before. I think this signifies kind of an overall change in direction, bringing this guy. You know what? I, I enjoyed The Legend of Tarzan. I know a lot of people didn't, and, and that's cool. I felt out, I walked out of the film going, ah. And I actually think the script for Jack Ryan's Saddle Recruit was better than the film was executed. So I think it's pretty good news. If they follow through on this, with Academy Award-winning director Mel Gibson coming on and directing it, suddenly Suicide Squad 2 becomes a film that I think a lot of people should be really excited about and what it could do and which direction they could go. And I think if they bring like a Mel Gibson on, I think DC might actually toy with the idea of letting Suicide Squad be rated R. 
Uh, and and if they do that right. with a director like that and a writer like that, I could change the game. I don't know. What do you think, Perry? If we had a Mel Gibson directed R-rated Suicide Squad sequel, that would easily like skyrocket it to one of my most <laughs> anticipated movies. That is what I want. In terms of this particular writer, you know, when you have a track record like that, it's it's a little tough to get super hyped that he si- that he's going to sign on to write Suicide Squad too, rather than if it had been someone that I was familiar with and liked their work a little more. But looking back, I was just thinking about um, Eric Heiser, who sure. I gave a tough time to for right. a while because I didn't like A Nightmare on Elm Street. I didn't like The Thing. And then he gave us Lights Out, and he gave us Arrival. So sometimes, especially in these big studio systems, when there's more than one writer involved in a project, it isn't necessarily reflective of his abilities. So I'm going to give this guy a chance. I mean, why can't he write a good Suicide Squad sequel? And, you know, there's also no telling whether or not they're going to eventually, you know, bring someone else in, because often with these types of movies, there are many writers attached. So that's possible, but... The fact that I want another Suicide Squad movie, even though I didn't love Suicide Squad, and that, that just speaks to the entire DCEU and what we're talking about the whole beginning of the show with them possibly restructuring things. Like That is the coolest thing about DC. It's like, even though some of the stuff that they released isn't that great, there are just so many opportunities to make it better. And even though we're not in the best spot right now, it's still so exciting looking forward. Schnapp, let me ask you this. Sure. With what looks like a pattern right now that... Before writing the new Batman script, they get in Matt Reeves to make sure the director is there to be a part of that process. Mm-hmm. It sounds like they're working hard to get the, a director in place for Man of Steel 2. Hopefully it's Matthew Vaughn. Right. Before they write the script. If they're talking about, now they've got a script writer, what do you think the chances are that Suicide Squad 2 already has its director and they just haven't announced it yet? Uh, the chances are very high. Um, also, I mean, you know, like you said, I mean, I, I liked the thing reboot, I mean, the requel or whatever you want to call it, and I think the script was the strongest part of it. I thought the execution and the bad CG is what ruined that prequel, you know. So but anyway, but what I'm talking about is, like, I don't know what the story is yet for this Suicide Squad 2, and that's really, really important because I think... Ayer was a little bit out of his league, like he was forced to write this script really quickly, and he didn't really probably put the best end of the story together. I love the introduction of the squad, but them fighting a sorceress at the end was really stupid and just just like counterintuitive when you have... I want to see the Suicide Squad go against an even meaner group of yes, uglier yes. Suicide Squatters, whatever. It should be like a squad versus squad. It should be R-rated. When you said that... Mel Gibson, R-rated Suicide Squad. I got a smile on my face. I was like, now that's what I want to see. I would pay so much money to see that. See it. I would pay for everyone here at Collider to go see it. Oh, wait. Yay. I don't know about that. We now have that on video. Oh, no. Gonna- I will. If it's R-rated and Mel Gibson is paying, I'm paying a lot of money to see everyone at Collider is going to see it. All right. Well, guys, there are a few other films opening up this week that we're going to chat about here. Natasha, what's coming up? The Belko Experiment. In a twisted social experiment, 80 Americans are locked in their high-rise corporate office in Bogota, (coughs) Colombia, and ordered by an unknown voice coming from the company's intercom system to participate in a deadly game of kill or be killed. T2 train spawning is also coming out. After 20 years abroad, Mark Renton returns to Scotland and reunites with his old friends Sick Boy, Spud, and Begbie. So, uh, Schnepp, out of these two movies, which ones are you most looking forward to seeing? Train spotting 2, I'm going to see it today. <laughs> lust for life. I got a lust for life. Can't wait. I cannot wait. What about you, Perry? Uh, yeah, I guess I have to say train spotting. I have seen Belko. I think it's a rock solid movie. Didn't really suit my taste. I kind of had a similar reaction as I did to James Gunn's Super, where it felt a little too violent and mean spirited, surprisingly for me. But, you know, it's still very well shot and acted, and it's a, it's a crazy concept. James Gunn being violent and mean spirited yeah. makes me very happy and excited. <laughs> I'm very, I still haven't seen Belko Experiment. I'm probably going to run out and check that out later tonight. Which one are you looking forward to? Yeah, for me, it's, it's definitely Train Spotting 2. The first one is probably still Danny Boyle's best movie. Really interested to see where these cast of characters are so many years ago. Um, very interested because it's gotten good buzz so far, yet they haven't. This is the rare case where they haven't done any screenings for the press here. They've been saving it for festivals. So that doesn't necessarily mean anything at all, but I just I, I do want to see that movie. The Belko Experiment... The fact that Gunn wrote it is is interesting to me, but it's just not something. I feel like it's it's the premise seems like it's been done a billion times. All right, guys, we reached our part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Natasha, what do we got? 
Well, our time with Chris Evans' Captain America may be coming to an end. As part of a wide-ranging cover story and interview with Esquire magazine, Evans discusses his future with Marvel and seemingly reveals that after his contract is fulfilled after the fourth Avengers Infinity War, he'll be hanging up the shield. A portion of the story hit online saying, Settling in on the couch, he groans. Evan explains that he's hurting all over because he's just started his workout routine the day before to get in shape for the next two Captain America films. The movies will be shot back to back beginning in April. After that, no more red, white, and blue costume for the 35-year-old. He will have fulfilled his contract. Perry, buy or sell Chris Evans hanging up the shield after the last Avengers movie. I'm going to buy that it's going to happen because I really do think that his interests might lie elsewhere at this point and he might just want to wrap it up. There's always a possibility that he could renew his contract kind of like uh, Robert Downey Jr. did where it's so he's not in a starring position and he just makes appearances, but... I think he might have had enough. He he clearly wants to direct and he wants to explore other other movies too. In between all the Captain America movies, he's made some great stuff. I mean, Snowpiercer is one of my favorite movies of the last five years. So I want to see him do other things. But then again, I wish I could sell this because he, he is one of my favorite Avengers. And I think Chris Evans has just crushed it in that role. He's a great leader. He's a great leader for this whole MCU. And I'd be sad to see him go. However... You know, when you think about how many MCU movies we've had, and actually I was thinking about it comparing uh, to Star Wars. You know, you just have to, you have to pass the torch to keep things fresh at some point. So I, I guess it's, it, it might be due. That might have to happen at this point. Christian? Yeah, I'm going to buy it. I, th I think, I, you know, I'm always the harbinger of death anyway. I think he's <laughs> toast in, uh, in Infinity War. I don't think he's going to make it through, and I think that it'll finally, it'll finally give us... In Infinity War or in Avengers 4? Uh, probably Avengers 4. Right. I, th I think because when you're watching, we, we as Marvel fans, as much as a lot of us have loved it, have said, ah, there's never, you know, everyone's going to make it. You know, everyone's going to, no one's really, I mean, here and there, some people go, but no one that you really cared about yet. It's a good way for him to go out. It's, and what happens next? What's the MCU look like without Captain America in it? Like, and not like, oh, he could come back as a mystical. No, he's dead. Uh, and I think what Perry said also is that Chris Evans' his passion lies in other places and directing one of those things. I think that he's, he's a really talented actor. I think he's going to want to do more. We're, Hugh Jackman has spoiled us. Hugh Jackman has been playing Wolverine for 17, 17 years. years. Mm. So everyone thinks, well, everyone's going to play these big characters for 17 years. Now, that is rare, man. That is rare. And Chris Evans playing it for this long, we have been... We've been lucky that he has wanted to do it that long because he has really served the role. Captain America was not supposed to work. It just wasn't. For when you look at what ultimately could have played very goofy. You look at that the first one they did years ago. That thing was a disaster. And then when he comes out and he you're not talking about the Chris Evans first one. You're no, no, about no, no, the no, one no, 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 no. I'm talking about Salinger right. '90s yes, yes, one. Yeah. Yes, and then and then when Chris Evans comes in crushes it. And you're like that's Captain America. Right. And there you go. So I think that he is going to eat it. I kind of hope he does because I think it'll add so much more uh, weight to the overall property. Are you trying to make every Marvel fan cry? Yes. A, Iron Man and Captain America die in Infinity War. All right, let's see the next one. It's not going to happen. You can't kill America. <laughs> right. um, I, um, here's, here's the interesting thing to, to keep in mind. I sell that he's not, not going to continue to be Captain America after uh, Avengers 4, whatever Avengers 4 eventually ends up being named. Um, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's important to, important to point out that the quote about him uh, the saying he's hanging it up after a kid, that's actually not a quote from Chris Evans. Chris Evans doesn't actually say that. It's simply the magazine is pointing out correctly that after Avengers 4, Chris Evans's um, run and his contract <clears throat> is up after Avengers 4. Yep. And that is true. So whether or not that... Then they then speculated that, hey, his thing's up, so it's going to be the end of the road for him. Or whether or not Chris Evans told them that, it's not a quote, though. Right. And so I'm not quite sure to interpret that. It's also important to keep in mind that it wasn't that long ago that he made that big statement we talked about here on the show, that he said, hey, look, I'm going to be Captain America as long as they want me to be Captain exactly. America. Right? There's another thing to keep in mind here, too. While he may have, you know some passions in some other areas. He wants to direct. He wants to do other things. The fact of the matter, though, is, is that Chris Evans is human. He has never had anything, no human being on the face of the earth, very, very few, have had something as successful and as beloved and as monetarily rewarding as his run as Captain America. 
The fans love him. He's able to do a whole lot of stuff because of his run as Captain America. And as much as people loved uh, the train movie, Snowpiercer. Um, Snowpiercer which I actually thought was a little bit overrated. Working title Ooh. was The Train um, Movie. <laughs> the Train <laughs> Movie. Right. Untitled um, Train Movie. Uh, I liked it, but I, 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 got, was, I was late to the party on that one, and I heard everybody talking up so much, I thought, oh, that's good, but whatever. Uh, and then he did that little romantic comedy recently that nobody went to go see. That was the one he directed. Mm -hmm. and that was the one he yeah. directed, and nobody went to go see it. It got no buzz. I just think as a professional, you got to think, I am killing it. Not just do fans love it, I love doing it, mm -hmm. and I'm getting all this stuff, and he's got to know that if he continues to be Captain America, he'll get more opportunities down the road because he's Captain America. I got a feeling he knows that if he stops being Captain America, Chris Evans is not a one-trick pony. He's, no. he's, he was great before Cap. Go see The Losers, if you haven't yeah, seen The Losers, really by good. the way. He yeah. was great in that. But, I mean, nothing will afford him more opportunities and more, more reward than by being Captain America. I... I just don't think he's going to be done. I, I totally agree. That's why I was saying you can't kill America. He's He is Steve Rogers, and he's going to be Steve Rogers for as long as he physically can. He's 35 years old. He's young. He can play. He could do another three Captain America movies and two more Avengers films. He could take a break and let Bucky be Captain America for two, three, four years, come back as Steve Rogers. These movies take two to three years every time anyway, from production yeah. to we get to see them. So, And we're all for anything that Evans wants to do. At least I think it's like, look, go do, go be creative. I think a lot of people, once they hit a stride like this, they're like, yo, I'll do one for you, then I'll do your big movie. It's not even like that for him because he's... Christopher Nolan did that, right? He did exactly. a Batman movie, did something else. Yeah. Did a Batman movie, did something else. He could still do that. But I'm just saying, like, even... I mean, Evans has said it. He said, I, I could play Captain America forever. This is the greatest role I've ever had. So I think as long as he can keep doing that, I know it's physically draining. Look, I mean, I'm not... I can't do that. Look, come on. He's Captain America. So I just say keep doing it for as long as he can. That's what we all hope. But and if, if anything, you brought up Wolverine and the Hugh Jackman situation. If we know anything, like Hugh Jackman said, the one thing that has always pulled him away from doing Wolverine is the fact that his workout <clears throat> schedule right. is mm -hmm. nuts. And I remember I actually interviewed Chris Evans uh, in San Diego just before the first public screening of the first Captain America movie. And, of course, he's got that one scene where the... the uh, the case opens and he's in there all ripped, right? He goes, dude, I like worked out six days a week, four hours a day for like a year for that one scene. <laughs> and it's like, and you got to imagine, of course, and then he does the helicopter scene right. in Civil War. It's like, well, you know, that was the money shot for them. I mean, maybe at some point you do all these workouts, you think, I just, I want to eat some spaghetti, man. Right. I just want to <laughs> eat some spaghetti. <laughs> all right, what's next? Let's cheat this That's for. perfect. Okay, Pixar has released the very first trailer for Coco, a new concept that follows aspiring musician Miguel as he teams up with the charming trickster Hector on an extraordinary journey through the land of the dead. Pixar adds Coco to the release slate this year that already includes Cars 3. And while that third movie in the franchise is sure to set the box office on fire, Coco appears to be a return to its original storytelling form that was reignited again with Inside Out. Coco is co-directed by Toy Story 3's Lee Unkrich and Monsters University story artist Adrian Molina. And will hit theaters later this year on November 22nd. Christian, buy or sell the first trailer for Coco. Uh, I gotta tell you, I'm gonna just. Oh. I know, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna no. M no. just, just, no, just buy. Yes. Take it easy. <laughs> just, <laughs> just gonna buy it right there because I've seen this movie already. It's called Book of Life. I've seen it already. Um, but I might be absolutely wrong. The movie comes out, it's a d completely different film. But I was hoping for a little bit more. And I think because Pixar has been knocking it out of the park so hard lately, and so is the, the Disney side of the animation, that I was real like, when. We were talked about that the notes came out this morning that we were going to do this movie or watch this trailer. I couldn't wait for it. Eh, it's okay. As I, I'm not going to sell it because of what they've been doing. But there was nothing in this that made me go, "Oh my God, this looks like the next next heartbreaking Pixar movie." I thought it was going to be so cool, and it's just kind of meh. I um I was also not super enthusiastic about the trailer. And now part of that might be because this trailer went in such a different direction than I was expecting. For everything else we've seen from Coco so far has been just a story about a young boy with a dream in, in like in poor circumstances and he's got a dream to play music. This one goes into Book of Life territory like which I was not expecting. Mm -hmm. So my my subdued reaction to the trailer, I think part of it might just be because it was not what I thought it was going to be. It's completely different. Looks beautiful all that stuff. However, I will say this. I had the same thoughts when I saw the Wally trailer. I didn't think Wally looked very good at all. 
And that film is mm. freaking amazing. That film should have been nominated for Best Picture. It should have been nominated. For, I thought the same thing with the Up trailer. The sure. first time I saw Up. And Up was nominated for Best Picture. And I ended up loving both those films. So I am not in the doubting Pixar business. So, But I, I'm going to admit that just on the basis of the trailer alone, I wasn't... I still don't know how I feel about the trailer. So I'm just ever so slightly going to sell it at this point. Oh, I don't know. What God, do you think, You guys Carrie? are breaking my heart. It's a big buy. And I'll give you the fact that it does, you know, have a Book of Life vibe, of course. And many people may be thinking about that. But... I thought this was just such a great teaser trailer. Like, this is what a teaser mm. trailer should be. Giving you a moment with the character, and then it builds, and it gives you some story points, and then when it opened up the world, I got chills. I thought it was great. And the one, the, the text that was on the screen, we are all a part of those who came before. It's like, you see something like that, and when it hits at the right moment of the scene with the right music beats, that's something that gives you chills, too. Super cute dog. Felt the need to point that out. I think this thing <laughs> looks absolutely beautiful, and it's Dante. just... It, even looking at like the stuff here, so when uh, when Inside Out came out, I got to do one of those set visits there, and they show you each individual department at Pixar, and it's just you you don't really realize how much goes into it, just in terms of like cinematography and lighting. And I keep looking at like those flakes and just imagining oh, imagining them talking about how they have to light each individual thing. It's just I look at the footage that I saw in this teaser trailer, and I see them taking it another step up. Snap. I'm going to buy it. I mean, I agree with both of you guys as far as like it wasn't what I expected. It did take a strange turn, but I found it emotionally engaging. And I feel like as a as the very first trailer to this film, it's introducing us to the concept that by when we actually see this movie, all of us will probably be in tears crying. It's going <laughs> to it's going to bring on the waterworks because it feels like it's talking about all the things that are important about life and memories and what. You, uh, what people who die mean to you. It, it has that what dreams may come kind of vibe to it. Yeah. Where I yeah, feel like it's going to be a very kind of a, and it'll be really good for families to see it and kids to see this because just like Kubo, it broaches and talks about death. And that's something that's very scary to people. And I think this, in a, by dealing with it in a very intelligent and emotional way, I feel like just seeing this Coco trailer, I want to see the next trailer. I don't want to cry in the movie, <laughs> which I might, but I want to see the next, I want to see it. I, Natasha, I heard you almost crying over there when you heard Christian and I kind of not yes. being said. What did you think about the trailer? Um, okay, huge buy, but I need to explain. So when I first, you know, saw that Pixar was doing the all voice Latino cast of Coco, I was like, okay, can you do something that hasn't been seen already? Like there's so much more to Mexican culture and Latino culture than the Day of the Dead. And while it's beautiful and fascinating to see on screen and I loved it in the Book of Life, I was skeptical. Now watching this teaser trailer, I'm all for it. First of all, yeah, I pretty much did cry already and I already know I'm gonna <laughs> cry during the whole movie. The music, you know they're gonna talk about family. Family is so important to so many cultures so it's not even just for Latinos. But then when he's like, doing the guitar riff to, you know, his icon, like, I on like the that movie. Yeah, and then too. he's, like, he sees the, you know, the Dia de los Muertos skeleton, and she's, like, screaming at him. Like, <laughs> I just got so many chills. And then seeing the day, the Land of the Dead, I was like, okay, this isn't Book of Life. It's, it's a Pixar touch. It's going to be stunningly visual. Like, I just can't wait for this. And I can't wait to see more. It was a perfect teaser. I Wendy? Bet. I loved it. I think this kid is super adorable. I am betting that I am already going to go buy the soundtrack when it's available because from what I've heard, I already liked it. And I know it looks like the Book of Life, but I don't think it's going to follow the same route just because it's based on the same same day. Um, I think this this is going to be quite different. It's not going to be your your happy-go-lucky type um, har har you know, fart jokes type of Pixar movie. I think it's going to be more like up where it's yeah. going to like wreck you in the theater. So I'm probably going to go see this with a box of tissues. No, I was just going to say, like, I think that that was the first half of this trailer, I thought, was a lot stronger than the second half because the first half was the playing the guitar, the moment that Natasha just brought up, which I thought was great. It reminded me of kind of old school Pixar and did have those up moments. It's just that once he got into the dead part of it, I was like, that just automatically took me to Book of Life. I, I kind of disagree with Wendy a little bit. I thought it looked exactly like Book of Life once you got to it. It didn't look different at all for me when you got there. But that's the trailer. So it could be radically different once you get to the movie. I just thought the first half was a little stronger for me, but yet I still bought it. I just realized maybe the one thing that turned me off the trailers a little bit, when at the end he's going, 
be careful, Dante. We don't know where we... And he looks up, and then they reveal what looked like, to me, the Gungan underwater city. Oh. And oh, maybe, no. maybe, maybe no. that's what kind of took me out of it. Mesa disappointed with you, John Campillo. Mesa, everybody dead. <laughs> All right, Natasha, what's next? Well, I do have to add that every time I see Coco, I just think, I'm in love with the Coco. <laughs> and I know that's inappropriate because it's Pixar, I was Pixar, talking about Ice Tea's Coco. Every time I hear Coco, I was like, what, is there a movie with Ice Tea's Coco in it? I think we should pause the show just for a second and have Natasha sing the entire song. I don't um, even know the whole the song, but like I'll do a little dance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? All right, next one. Okay, Variety is reporting that real-life Hollywood couple John Krasinski and Emily Blunt will co-star in their first feature film together. Krasinski is set to rewrite and direct the Paramount Platinum Dune supernatural thriller, A Quiet Place, marking his third directorial effort and first major studio release. Most of the plot details are under wraps, with Variety only saying that the movie is set on a farm where a supernatural being has been terrifying a family for some time. The spec was bought preemptively by Paramount from Scott Beck and Brian Woods and has set Michael Bay and his partners Andrew Form and Brad Fuller to produce. The film goes into production this fall. John Byersell, A Quiet Place with Krasinski directing and Emily Blunt starring. I buy it. I think Krasinski is a super talented dude. And I think one of these days... He's uh, leatherheads aside. I think he's going to be the next Clooney. I really, I think at some point he's going to be whether it's five years, ten years from now. I think he's going to be that on screen and behind the camera force kind of guy. I really do think he has that kind of talent, and I think we're we're only starting to see the uh, him scratch the surface of it. Combine in there his wife. I usually get a little bit nervous when I hear filmmakers and their spouses doing something to get. I don't know why, but Emily Blunt in something like this, the story sounds great, the talent sounds great. Big buy for me. Schnepp, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to buy it. What was the film that Krasinski did with uh, Matt Damon? Do you remember that? The one oh, about the, 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 the farm or the, yeah. the fracking. zoo? Yeah, or? the fracking no, one. Fracking one. Was, and I think uh, Krasinski directed uh, that. Uh, no, the, right? the Hollers? No, it was no, no. That, that's no, the no, one he, he directed. That's Van Zant directed. I know exactly oh, what you're talking okay, about. Okay, sorry. Anyway, I thought yeah, it was about Krasinski. fracking. Yeah, Krasinski's an amazing actor. Um, I didn't see the film that he directed. But, the uh, Hollers is the one he directed. Okay, I didn't see that one. But yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what he's going to do. I think Emily Blunt's a great actress. I love horror films. Sounds like it could be interesting. I don't know anything really about it, but bringing those two people together to make it, I'm going to buy it. Perry, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a package that why wouldn't you buy it and give it a shot? I wouldn't say there's anything about it at this point that has me saying, oh my God, this sounds so crazy unique in any respect, but I'm excited for John Krasinski to see him continue to direct and improve that way. I'm excited for the two of them. I mean, even though, you know, you might have some conflict in that kind of working environment, working with your spouse, it's pretty cool that they get to make a movie together. And I always think about that when, you know, people are in, in the industry and they have a family and they have to just take off and say goodbye for X amount of months. So it's cool that they get to be together and do this. And I know, at Platinum Dunes actually seems like a good place because yeah, it seems like the right kind he's of got a this. relationship with them and this this idea too because Platinum Dunes has had some success with with horror. Well, he worked with things. Platinum Dunes on, on, with Thirteen Hours. It was yeah. Dunes, yeah, was involved with that. Mm -hmm. So and he had some really good success with that. Uh, Promised Land was the name of the, uh, oh, right. the movie that right they did together. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm gonna buy this because <clears throat> this is it's a trick question because in you know, five, six months from now or whenever it is, when, or, or a year from now when we have a trailer for it, we could sell it because we don't like the way it looks. But we're buying this off of the <laughs> fact that what we like from Krasinski so far, the fact that he is a talented dude, it looks like he's going to, he, he's, he's very similar to what we were talking about with Chris Evans before. His attention is straying more towards directing right now, and his wife is obviously a very talented woman, one of the most talented actresses, actors, actresses working today. Um, she's going to be a great Mary Poppins suck at Mark Ellis. That's right, I agree. <laughs> I don't think he thinks she's going to be bad. I think he's just he just has no heart. Um, <laughs> but I think that this this movie is yeah, I'm going to buy it because I, I want to see a supernatural movie kind of like this with these with these this team. I'm in. All right, guys, well, we're doing this show live, and as we like to do when we do live shows, we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of this show to take your live Twitter questions. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Start firing some questions, and then Wendy will pick some out to read on air. But I want to remind you that Movie Talk's not the only show we got going on here on Collider Video. A little bit later today, we've got Christian Harloff and his Jedi Council will be breaking down all the world of Star Wars for you guys. Of course, we have a brand new awesome tacular will be dropping tomorrow on the Verizon Go 90 Network. You'll be able to find links for that as well. But also tomorrow, we've got a little Schmodown movie trivia competition going on. Check this out. I will be turning the lion's den into a litter box. Makuga for the win. 
all it takes is one enemy. Today, that's going to be me. That match goes up on Collider Video tomorrow. Make sure you keep your eyes open for it. All right, it is time for Mailbag. Listen, guys, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Natasha, what's in the mailbag today? Brian writes, hey, Collider, was wondering what song always transports you to the movie you heard it playing in. For me, no matter where I am or time of day, whenever I hear Stuck in the Middle with you by Steeler's Wheel with a chill and a grin, I'm automatically brought back to that scene in Reservoir Dogs. Yeah, that one's... A great one. The one to me, I'm not saying it's the best song. I'm not saying it's the best movie. But when I hear Brian Adams start singing Everything I Do, I Do It For You, mm -hmm. I am instantly teleported into that movie, uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. And it kind of makes me want to go and watch <clears> the movie <throat> again for whatever reason. It's a spoon. Um, I, I love I love that when a song connects you with a movie like that. Mm. But that is the one for me. Christian, what about you? I got two. I got uh, It's All Right from Caddyshack by Kenny Loggins. Automatically, so what? Yeah. So let's dance. Uh, and I also have uh, Eye of the Tiger, Rocky, immediately. Uh, I thought you were going to go with the uh, family uh, vacation song. Oh, Holiday Road, yeah, Holiday absolutely. Road. Yeah, but that, that one doesn't that one doesn't play unless you're watching Vacation. <laughs> That's true. What about you, Perry? This actually just came up when I was hanging out with my family. I'm obsessed with Empire Records, mm. and I was uh. obsessed with that whole soundtrack. So every time I hear "If You Want uh, Blood" or "Till I Hear From You," that movie made me obsessed with the Jim Blossoms and. Not music, but anytime I hear a Jurassic Park dinosaur roar in any other movie, it takes me out of the movie and yeah. transports me back to Jurassic Park. Do you know we had Johnny Whitworth on this show before? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> now, I can introduce you to Johnny. <gasps> Wait, did that make you happy? Oh, I'm so happy already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to I don't think that. I've ever seen you turn <laughs> this red on camera before. This He's is great. I, up, I really grew up with the biggest crush on him and Ethan Emery. Right. <laughs> and Ethan Emery follows me on Twitter right now, and every <laughs> single time I just like melt over it. Blooper. <laughs> what song works does that for you? I'm singing in the rain. Oh, yeah. Just singing in the rain. Clockwork oh, Orange. Uh, Clockwork, Clockwork Orange. Orange. Yeah. yeah. That's every time I hear that song. It used to be Gene Kelly scrimping around in the in the rain, turned into some evil ultra violence. So that's how it rocks. All right, guys, I said we'd take some of your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Albert Rodriguez, who writes, If Matthew Vaughn brings a soft reboot to Man of Steel 2, any chance we get the classic John Williams score? No, I don't think so. I think, and, and that, look, as much as anybody else, I go into a Superman movie, I want to hear, bum, 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 yeah. but... I completely agree with Warner Brothers' decision on that, is that we have to enforce that this is a new Superman. And I get that. And I think playing the John Williams score, at least in a significant way, could be cool if they walk into a restaurant and maybe it's playing on a jukebox in the background. That's fine. But I think them playing that iconic, legendary theme right. would probably be counterproductive to what they're trying to do. I don't know. What do you think? I, I'm going to go the other way. I, I, I would like them to bring it back. I think that it could be, you know, it's just, it's, as where Star Wars is Star Wars' theme, I think Superman could have that theme and still be okay and still make it out to where it's like you could say, okay, that's fine. It's not the same universe. It's not the same Superman. It's not Christopher. It's a completely different Superman, but it's still the theme. I think that it is It's just something... That's something I always wanted back. Like I got so happy in the Lego Batman movie when they rang the bell and then like, dun, 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 dun. they even played they even played the Fortress of Solitude theme also. <laughs> yep. Yes, I would love for them to bring it back. I don't think that they will, but I think it would be okay if they did. Yep. You know, broaching the subject, why not? I mean, why not? You can have Zimmer score and you can have John Williams score in there. It's part of the Superman legacy. It's part of his history. Redux it, Zimmer it up, do something different with it, add to it, keep it the original. It doesn't matter. I, I think that's so burned in. Like you just said with Star Wars, I wouldn't be mad at it because characters and, uh, you know, there'll be other people playing Superman forever. But that score is so indicative of Superman. I wouldn't mind seeing it back in. Which, by the way, I mean, the Zimmer score it's is fantastic. Utterly fantastic. It's amazing. I can, I, every once in a while, about once a month in my office, I'll just put on Zimmer's <laughs> Superman mm -hmm. theme and rock out to him. By the way, search on YouTube for John Williams, just for Williams, Zimmer, Superman, 
mix up. Ooh, that's somebody the, mixed it. Well, and that's got, why I think that it could happen. It has the two pieces of music together, Ooh. and mm-hmm. it sends chills wow. down my spine. When totally I listen to Riley, that. Found, Riley found that for when he, I forget, I think he went up against Dewberry in the Ultimate For his entrance mm-hmm. music, he That was that. where we found that from, and wow. then he came out to that, and we just lost our minds because it was so I'm listening great. to that right after that's this great. show. Yeah. Well, Christian, you were playing all those, the mashups for me yesterday, and like that Power Rangers ones make me think that they could put that in there and just like have it be super subtle and different, yet it still has that chilling effect when when big fans just know it and they hear it and it still works but feels completely new and fresh. Yeah, well, well, Perry's bringing up too. I haven't debuted it yet, but we have a f- there's a fan who's a composer, <laughs> Sky Vince, um, and he composed all these mashups, and we're gonna debut one of them when Schmoes plays top ten on Tuesday. Nice. All right, what's next? Next one comes from Grey Jedi two eight who writes: So New York wrongly voted against liquor at the movies. Do you guys like a cold one legally at the movies? I have, I I have look I. Personally, generally speaking, I don't drink, so it's not a big deal to me. I don't see why any adult can't have an adult beverage while watching a movie. I, I just don't understand that. If you're worried, make put a limit, put a five per limit customer <laughs> if you want. If you're if you're afraid of people getting completely yeah. booze hound out and causing problem, but I, I mean. I, that's a problem that's easily avoidable. I think it's perfectly fine that people have drinks in theaters. And it gives theaters a way. Look, it's very difficult for theaters to keep their doors open. It really is. It's a tough business for them to make money because the studios take so much of the of the actual ticket price back. I think it's great that theaters should be allowed to do that. I don't see a, a rational reason why they shouldn't. I, I don't care either way, to be honest. It's like If they have a bar outside, I think like the AMC Burbank over here yep. has the bar like right outside. You can't, I mean, MacGuffins. You you don't, yeah. you don't need, I, I mean, I don't think that you necessarily need to have a beer in the theater. I'm not saying don't, but I just, it doesn't, I'm like, oh man, I can't have my beer here's, in the theater. Here, here's what I'll say. I'll say after 10 o'clock, anybody who's going to see movies after 10, have like a five drink minimum. <laughs> Got to have at least wow. five, at least five, five drinks. <laughs> what you watch? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> my biggest peeve when I go see a movie, a lot, I got a lot of peeves when I go see movies. You don't be talking on your phone. Don't be talking during the film. It's, there's a lot of a lot of peeves I got, but the biggest one is when you hear like a glass bottle like gug, 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 and roll down. <laughs> beyond irritating. It's like that means they're just <laughs> drunk. Just that's you're you're ruining the uh, the experience when you go see a movie. You can get drunk at your own house at your own house. Theater going is like a communal experience. So I'm pretty I sure think, they'll give it to you in a plastic cup. Right, so that means they snuck in the beer. So whatever, I'm just saying, <laughs> relax with the drinking. Unless it's like after, like I say, yeah, after 10, you're going to see a movie re- late night, you can get drunk, I don't care. And then uh, so I was seeing a midnight screening. I've heard so many bottles hit the floor mm. rolling. Yeah. People, oh, where am I? Shut up! You know, well, that's, that's just how it is. places like Alamo Draft House, yes. where you have the tabletop, and unless you're just plain old stupid, you're not going to knock the bottle from totally. the bar stand. But that's the reason that I think we need drinking in theaters. Alamo Draft House is the greatest place ever. I've said it, and I'll keep saying it, because yes. I love it. I want my pizza, I want my beer, and I want my boozy milkshake, and I'm super happy, especially at a midnight Alamo screening. Draft House is incredible. This is a free advertisement for Alamo Draft House, because I've gone when I went to Austin, and I was like, this is unreal. I'm having a piece of pizza and a coffee <laughs> And a and a, a beer at the same time, like just enjoying a movie. And I mean, the cookie it's crazy. sampler, you have to have the cookie sampler. I didn't too. rock the cookies. Oh, oh my the, god! In, in Los Angeles, I think there's two of them in Los Angeles now. AM, I know AMC has a uh, what they call their dining theaters sure. that are not just recline leather chairs, like full recline leather chairs. They will bring you a blanket. They, and then you have a full menu and a bar menu. They will bring you all your food and your drinks, and it's like it's kind of a cool experience. Now, I am curious. Like, not a lot of people know Natasha basically shows up at the office here every day, completely hammered, hammered. just oh. just <laughs> yeah. just belligerent. What can I get there, guys? Screaming. This is not She's angry. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> it ain't coffee in that cup. Ain't Who's coffee. kitten within the parking lot? Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> All right, what's next? I'm angry today. Oh, my. <laughs> Andrew Vanderward writes, uh, what is the status of Andy Serkis' Jungle Book movie? I haven't heard anything since Disney's came out. Yeah, I'm, okay. So shortly after the Disney one came out, they pushed it back another year. Since that announcement, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if anybody could have predicted. I certainly didn't that that Jungle Book movie that Jon Favreau did would be that bloody good. Because that movie was just freaking awesome. Oh, yeah. And I think it was the right move. You can't release like 18 months later another Jungle Book movie because it's going to be compared to that one Favreau did. Whether or not they've it's gone into hiatus or whether or not they're still moving ahead for that, I think it was either 2019 or 2020 was when they said they pushed it back to. I can't remember exactly. 
Um, whether it's still on track for that or whether it's been canceled, I don't know. I haven't heard anything else since they said they bumped it another year. Have you guys heard anything else? I haven't heard anything, mm-hmm. and and I've said it many times, and I sit by any circuses in my top like five actors working today. I love the guy, and I want to see him direct. I think they should scrap this project. I really do. I, I want to see Andy Serkis direct. I want to see him direct soon. I think it is he's just fighting against the big tidal wave here, like because they are they already announced the Jungle Book two oh, on yeah. the Disney side of things. Uh, Everyone thinks about Jungle Book. There, people will, will go to see this movie thinking it's going to be a Jungle Book two, and then be disappointed yeah. when it's not. It's a complete. It's I think it's a it's a hard thing to to win right now. I is, think it's a lose lose yeah. unless he completely <laughs> reimagines it. Like does not make a straightforward Jungle Book adaptation whatsoever and does something kind of kooky and crazy. Mowgli is a New York advertising executive. Yeah. And Becomes Bal- a cab driver. Baloo is a cab driver. No, Baloo is a oh, cab driver. I like driver. that. I like Baloo that. is his cab driver. I will see go. that movie. <laughs> Mowgli's Five Wonders. I mean, is it called The Jungle Book? Yeah. His version too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he just got beaten to the, the punch. Jungle and that's- Book. Oh, it was previously titled Jungle Book Origins, and then I guess they retitled it. But the di- the release date it has now is October 19th, 2018. I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, it's one of those things where a lot of movies are always racing. Like, you have the two asteroid movies or the two volcano movies or the two invasion White films. House invasion. Yeah, yeah, White House movies. It's like, so it depends. Depends if they were both in production at the same time, and then one came out the couple months before, and then it's like, oh, well, now we have to see the other one and see if it's better or worse. But this isn't that case. They kind of like backed off, and the Jungle Book exceeded everybody's expectations. And Andy Serkis is known as the motion capture guy, so I'm sure they were going to be doing motion capture and all kinds of stuff like that. I think you're right, Christian. It's, his talent is better served doing something else. He's a super talented guy. They already nailed the Jungle Book. I'm sure he had a different interpretation of it, but at this point, Move on. And, and it'd probably be awesome too. Look, the movie that he is going to make, it's not, it's just a common go, but it doesn't matter what the comments said. It, but it, if, it, I think it'll be good. I think that the movie that he shot would be great. I just think, like Perry said, it is a lose lose. It is going to be hard to get people to disassociate with how, remember how profitable. Just in general, right. and and it's also it's geared more. It's it's a darker movie. It's not this. It's not the more kid friendly version. It's a hard movie to pull off. It'd be something to do if there was no other Jungle Book out there and this was the one that you're going after. Um, I, like you said, I just think he's too talented. <clears throat> Move on. He is the king of performance capture. Go and do that somewhere else with something else. I mean, someone mentioned this in the comments. Thundercats. I like that idea. I like that Thundercats idea. And let's not forget, like, uh, it's not like he hasn't directed before. Like, uh, Circus was like the second unit director on a lot of the Hobbit stuff. Sure. And, and, you know, he's worked on some yeah. big stuff. But let's keep this in mind, too. On a recent mailbag episode, both Christian and myself, we were asked about uh, Alita Battle Angel, and we both kind of said, I don't need, I'm not even sure they're going to make this movie huh. anymore. Turns out, the movie's already in production. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for all we know, maybe Andy Circus is already hard at work, and, and maybe his Jungle Book's already in production. They're already, I just yeah. haven't heard. They're already using sets <clears throat> from Alita Battle Angel for other projects. They're like, they've already wrapped out. Yeah. I don't know, I've just heard. I was like, oh, they're borrowing the set from Alita. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, they're already wrapped yep. with that stuff. So, All right, last question of the day. This one comes from Ethan. Ethan Kenestra, who writes, when can we expect an announcement about your involvement in Star Wars Celebration? Real soon. Yeah. Um, real soon. We uh, Look, we can tell you this. Uh, a bunch of us are going to be there. We're going to be doing some stuff there. There will be some meet and greet opportunities. Uh, without going into too much, i got to take some fools to school. Uh, we'll set that aside for a minute. But but probably, I'm, I'm hoping within the next week we're going to be able to make a full announcement about everything that we're going to be doing there. We're just waiting on a couple of things that are outside of our purview right now to fall into place, and then we can make our announcement. Do you want to add anything to that? No. I mean, everything you said as far as celebration goes, but we can also talk about <laughs> WonderCon, which is right around the corner. WonderCon yep, is, right. a, a, we're going to have a panel for the Schmodown on April 2nd at the Anaheim, Anaheim Convention, 1.30, so make sure you check us out What, what there. day? That it would be Sunday, Sunday, April 2nd. They were going to be there. And then, like John said, just a couple weeks later, we're all going to be at Star Wars Celebration. A lot of us are going to be at Star Wars Celebration. All right, guys, that'll do it for this installment of Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, getting in one more shot, Mr. Mm-hmm. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. See you later. Right over here, we got Perry Nemiroff with her GoPro. Oh, hi, guys. If you want to see all this glorious footage, you should watch Behind the Scenes this Saturday at 2 p.m. Also, here you go, Schnepp. I'm hosting a post-screening Q&A for the movie All Nighter with uh, Emile Hirsch and Annalie Tipton tomorrow night. It's at the Sundance Sunset Cinema at 7.30. I tweeted out a link if you want to get tickets. So that should be fun. And uh, Twitter is uh, at PNMROF. 
Mr. Christian Harloff. Uh, you can find me, well, today, obviously, on Collider Jedi Council, and then tomorrow on the Movie Trivia Schmodown with Jeff Snyder and Makuga. I just mentioned the Anaheim uh, WonderCon, April 2nd. Make sure you come and check that out. And then check out Behind the Scenes. Perry does this show every Saturday. It is awesome. And I thought I did a good Gary Busey impression. Natasha <laughs> crushes it this weekend. <laughs> I'm just full of surprises <laughs> today. Really of course, good. Natasha Martinez. Yes, I'm going to be sipping on my non-coffee and listening to I'm in love with the Coco. And you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Natasha Lexis underscore. You're also wearing a lot of white. I'm just saying. Anyway, oh. so oh. Wendy, what about you? Well, you can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And of course, you guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.